So reporting in Afghanistan, I'll start by just outlining what it was like or is like to report in Afghanistan or report about Afghanistan. And some of the, the challenges that we faced and had, uh, particularly as women, um, in the last 20 years, uh, because of the war and the ongoing um, uh, security issues, it was very difficult for, for that reason to report because um, when you have active conflict, uh, the danger to journalists, to their families, to their communities is, is much higher. And for that reason, many women um, weren't either encouraged or allowed to join uh, the media sector. Because of the security, the overwhelming reason was security, but also families were scared that that would look, reflect bad on them and the community will then turn against them if, if things didn't go their way or if there was pressure, outside pressure. So that was a huge issue for people. And second was also access to information. It, when you operate in a, in a highly security environment, it was very hard or it has been very hard to this day with the Taliban now, to get information out of those who govern. In the past, you had to go through a series of um, you know, ministries and uh, local offices to get a permission to cover a story, to cover a, an incident. But today, the Taliban um, have become this uniform <coughs> group um, as they are. But the way they have controlled the media space, the, the access to information space has been really difficult for journalists because it's very hard for A, you get hold of individuals in positions of power to ask them questions, and B, to get that information that you need in the first place to do your work with. So you are left with what you see on social media or individuals who report their own stories. And, and that has been a challenge, and it has always been part of uh, Afghanistan, um, but particularly in the last 20 years, as I said. And thirdly, the, one of the challenges that those of us reporting in Afghanistan dealt with was also skills, because the, the media space became what it was and what it is after the, uh, the post-9-11, after the massive investment in the media sector. And many young people joined the profession, and they were trained, but the training was not on that uh, level that, you, uh, that was needed for the sort of stories that, we covering, uh, that we were covering in, in the country. And when I say the sort of stories, those are heavy subjects, you know, security, death, destruction constantly. And the toll it took on individuals, the mental, the mental, uh, mental health um, toll it took on individuals, was huge. So for those four reasons, it has been, or it had been a very difficult environment to operate in. Um, and it continues to be difficult, but there are stories of hope. It's not uh, completely doom and gloom. Uh, there are good things that are happening. And the media sector was um, Afghanistan's biggest achievement, or the post 9-11 uh, government's uh, biggest achievement. And to some extent, it is true. It, it allowed new voices to come through, uh, it removed the gatekeepers, the traditional gatekeepers who were there to guard who could get access to platforms or who could say what. Uh, in the women, uh, there were many women who came from marginalized communities. Uh, they found their, their ways to the media sector and that allowed that democratization to take place in society that traditionally would not have been there had it not been for you know, this massive investment in the media sector. So, for those new voices, I'll always be grateful. And I continue to do that as part of my job is to, to seek out new voices, to seek out diverse opinions and diverse perspectives because as we have been talking, engagement is the way forward. And we always believe, those, those of us in the media always believed that it was a good idea <clears throat> in the long-term interests of the country that we seek out new voices and fresh perspectives uh, so they can provide those solutions as well as, you know, innovative solutions to some of the issues that Afghanistan was always dealing with and will continue to deal with. So I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you. That was very uh, precise and concise. Thank you very much. Uh, Ibrahim. Thank you, Bismillah ar-Rahman um, When we look at the collapse of the media, um, uh, there are various factors, but let me point to a couple of the trends. Um, one was the immediate collapse 
of the media sector after the Taliban's takeover or after the withdrawal of uh, the international uh, troops. And in the three months after the Taliban's takeover, 43% uh, of the media outlets inside the country disappeared. Out of nearly 11,000 journalists, only 4,300 remained. And 84% uh, of women journalists lost their jobs uh, as compared to 52% of the men. What uh, drove this? I think uh, there, there is a bit of conflation. Often we, we, we associate this uh, collapse of the media with the Taliban's takeover, but, but I think uh, it was equally driven by, first of all, the evacuations, because a lot of the middle class Afghans, the, the ones who had the connections and the means to get out, wanted to get out. So that was one of the reasons why many journalists had the ability and the will to get out. The other was also the funding freeze. With the Taliban in power, uh, the aid that was come trickling into Afghanistan was suddenly stopped, and Afghanistan began to face sanctions which were designed to be applied specifically to uh, groups or movements such as the Taliban, but now were imposed on the entire country. And because of those funding freezing, uh, a lot of the media organizations that had been thriving due to the grant and the aid uh, uh, collapsed. That's one of the trends. The other aspect of this trend, which again uh, gets conflated when it's often reported in the media, is the Taliban's restrictions on journalism. Uh, so the Taliban have employed various means of uh, restrict, uh, restricting journalists specifically. Uh, these include uh, censorship, what kind of topics they can cover. Uh, again, it, it, it's not to say that there weren't taboo topics in the previous Republican era, there were. But within the Taliban, I think the scope has expanded uh, to cover a lot more areas. Also, the Taliban's uh, treatment of journalists can be, uh, it can include arrests and assaults and uh, arbitrary detentions, which has created a climate of self-censorship. Uh, the uh, Taliban have imposed dressing restrictions and other reporting restrictions on female journalists. And lastly, uh, they have tightened rules around foreign journalists specifically, There's the, uh, uh, there, there is a lot of new rules and regulations and visa uh, uh, requirements for foreign journalists to be able to come visit and report from Afghanistan. Why are we seeing these restrictions? I think partly because the Taliban, like most political organizations, know the power of the media and they want to utilize it for their benefit. Uh, I think from the Taliban's perspective, uh, it, it might be safe to say that they know uh, the, the, uh, the potency and uh, power of the media because they were on the receiving end of it for 20 years and now they want to use utilize it to change uh, their image and build a new image. And secondly, also there's a lot of, uh, related to that, there's a lot of negative perceptions about the media within the Taliban's ranks and files. Uh, they are seen as collaborators of uh, you know, the, uh, what they would term the foreign occupation of the country over the past two decades, and people who are still trying to uh, engineer change sometimes against them. So these are some of the two kind of broad uh, motivations why the Taliban have been so singularly uh, focused on restricting journalists uh, inside the country. Uh, before I um, uh, hand it back to you, uh, the floor back to you, uh, let me talk about a couple of the trends that we're beginning to see. The Adam, um, um, I think they, they, they relate to the past but also to the future. One of those trends is the emergence of the diaspora media. Um, it is true, as I said, that the media inside Afghanistan collapsed, but that at the same time, we saw a spiraling and a sprouting of um, diaspora-related media, or media outlets that were based outside of Afghanistan, and they have been able to continue reporting on the co uh, country. Now, that, I would say, is perhaps a double-edged sword uh, in the sense that they are, they're <coughs> able to report on a lot of the topics that media inside the country is not able to report, and that uh, is a positive thing. Uh, but at the same time, because they're not present in the country and they are um, there are reports of Taliban uh, arresting uh, people who are working for diaspora uh, media because they don't have the, ostensibly because they don't have the licensing and whatnot. It also means they don't have on the ground presence 
and sometimes are not able to portray the, the nuances and the realities that are uh, inside the, the country. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Ibrahim. Uh, and the second uh, trend uh, that I think is not so clear cut, but we're beginning to see very small slivers of this is that uh, with restrictions on journalists, we're beginning to see the emergence of a cotton industry journalism appearing. Now, this is something that uh, has uh, accompanied the rise of social media all over the world, I, uh, I would say. But in Afghanistan, what we've seen, uh, for example, is with restrictions on female journalists working in official uh, media outlets, we've seen f some of these journalists moving to cotton industry journalists. They're, they've got YouTube channels where they're able to circumvent some of the uh, restrictions that have been imposed on them. Y you'd often find female reporters, if we can call them that, uh, looking at different, they, and they often look at apolitical top, um, topics, for example, Afghan cuisine or Afghan places or cultures. Uh, and whatnot, but they're able to circumvent some of the rules. They, they don't have to do the, uh, the hijab rulings that generally apply to journalists, and they're able to present a more uh, natural face of Afghan by speaking to normal Afghans uh, across the streets. Um, so I think that's a very uh, uh, unclear how much it will proliferate, but I think it's a positive sign uh, in, in this broadly negative picture around the media. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those opening remarks. And Ali? Um, you know, as someone who has lived and worked in Afghanistan for the last 10 years now, I kind of want to push back on some of these things. Um, if I had to summarize the situation of the media in Afghanistan in one sentence, I would say it's not good, but it's not nearly as bad as it could have been. Uh, and I think that that's very important to keep in mind. You know, uh, both my colleagues whom I have immense respect for kept talking about the collapse of media in Afghanistan. And thankfully, alhamdulillah, there has not been a collapse of media in Afghanistan. Media has been able to find ways to operate, maybe not to the extent that it did in the past, maybe with severe limitations, things that I have faced myself, but it is still going on. The fact that outlets like Tolo, Ariana, Shamshad still exist is a huge deal. In 1998, these things would have not mm -hmm. been there. And at the same time, as Bahis Saib said, you know, this idea of sort of social media in YouTube. Um, I'll give you two examples. Once I was at the Ministry of Information and Culture, and I was like, where's the Rais Saib? I need to talk to him. And they're like, oh, Rais Saib is giving an interview to a YouTuber. And the workers in the office were like, why are there so many YouTubers now? And in my head, I was like, why is he giving an interview to a YouTuber, you know? Um, and when we were in Herat for the earthquake, I remember there were these two girls in abayas, and they were just wandering around with like their phones and all that. And a friend of mine asked, uh, I was getting footage of something else, and asked, are, are you guys journalists? And they were like, no, we're with social media, you know, whatever mm. that means. But to say that, oh, also to get back to this idea of the collapse, the economic collapse of the media is extremely important because within the first month mm -hmm. or so, something like 100 media outlets closed down. Mm -hmm. And that was before all of the severe restrictions. That was literally a financial issue. And we're in Doha, given the current time, we got to say it. The world can find money for Israel, but it can't find money for Afghan media. You know? And it's really sad, because they're talking about freedom of speech and human rights and all of these things, which again, they make exceptions for, for some countries. Uh, but they're not providing the funding to these Afghan media outlets that could continue. Um, with that said, there are restrictions. There are constant reports from the Committee to Protect Journalists, from Reporters Sans Frontiers, from Human Rights Watch, from the New York Times, from uh, Amnesty, all of these outlets about abuse and detention of journalists. Obviously, the most famous case was uh, Murtazo Behboudi, who was in jail for something like 280 days. Afghan French guy, within like two days of coming to Kabul, he was arrested. No one knows why he was arrested. I asked the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they said, oh, well, we're not answerable to X, Y, and Z, only to the Afghan people. And I said, but I'm the Afghan people. <laughs> I don't know your answer. I'm scared. You know, he said, why are you always so scared? Why are you so paranoid in Afghanistan? And I said, why wouldn't I be? You know? Um, but despite that, people still manage to operate, and the media is still functioning. It's still able to report on a lot of things. You know, we had an interview, a very famous interview with the acting Minister of Defense, Mullah Yaqub. I'm sure it was pre-screened, 
but if Tom Cruise goes on The Tonight Show, it's pre-screened, right? Mm -hmm. But the fact that he agreed to be in that interview, the fact that he agreed to have an, an all-male audience, and that they were able to ask him about girls' education, and then a week later, there was an all-female panel hosted by a female presenter on the issues of inheritance in Islam on Afghan television in 2023 is unthinkable. Because as I said, in 1998, you could have never imagined something like this. Um, the Islamic Emirate has created systems for sort of like verification of journalists and getting documents, which by the way are like magic. When you present those, every door opens to you. Um, it's a little bit convoluted, but if you follow the rules, it seems to work. Um, and it's definitely meant to monitor you. They ask you to everything you want to cover. And you know, I'm like, well, what if a dinosaur is discovered in Herat? Like, I don't know. You know, what if a meteor lands in Helmand? How do I know what, what's in the news? You know, but you still send the list and you go through this process and you get a verification. But at the same time, like last year, I was essentially operating illegally because last year I was freelance, mm -hmm. right? Now I'm the Asia editor at the New Humanitarian. I have an official gig. Before I went, I gave both my passports. I gave um, an Ariza, how do you, like a document? Uh, uh, it's a press card, is that? It's, like it's like a letter that you present to like the ministry. Like a permit or something. Permit, yeah, yes. yeah. And, and I was like, here's everything. They're like, no, 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 we don't give to freelancers. You need to go find someone to vouch for you. And I'm like, that's not how freelance mm. reporting works. And so there are these other parts that they don't, for instance, saying like everything you want to cover while you're here. I don't know. Like I said, if a dinosaur is discovered in Herat, how would I know, you know? Or the earthquakes were, were a great example, although they lifted restrictions for that in Turkham, but still. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's possible, and that's very important to keep in mind, because I think so many times we say everything is shut off in Afghanistan, right? We say that nothing, not, nothing can be, the media is dead. Or we say like women can't leave the house at all, they're locked up in cages and so on and so forth. And if we don't apply these nuances, we're taking agency away from the Afghan people and we're giving it to the Islamic Emirate, we're giving it to the Taliban. Because they're gonna be like, well, they think the media is dead anyway, so what does it matter if we, you know, tomorrow say everything gets shut down? Uh, and it also makes light of the work and sacrifices of men and women who continue to try and keep the Afghan media alive. I think that's fascinating to be in a situation where you actually have to predict the news, right? you know, <laughs> to be able to cover the news. Um, so Afghanistan has gone through so many changes recently, which must include the way that you work, the way that you operate. So Sana, I'd like to ask you, how has your coverage uh, changed in the last couple of years? So that's a very good question, uh, and it's rather the nature of our work that has changed mm -hmm. so much that then affects the, the coverage of Afghanistan. Number one, because of the restrictions that Ibrahim outlined, um, our office was evacuated, and most of our colleagues who were based in Kabul and in the provinces, they were evacuated, they're now in the UK. So that means that we don't have any local coverage in the country. and. When you don't have local coverage, when you don't have local staff, you don't have local voices. Mm -hmm. When you don't have local voices, you're left with whatever we can come up from the outside. And it's that, um, in the previous discussion it was discussed, it's that outside view that um, we talk about and we, we, we try and report on what we hear from the outside. And that has limitations and it has implications for people inside Afghanistan, that's one. My program is slightly different because our mandate was always to bring the world to Afghanistan. It was world stories taken to Afghan viewers. Um, and it was a mostly international um, focused program and it works and it worked. But other media organizations were covering Afghanistan, Afghan stories for Afghans. So that is number one. Second, you have um, even agencies, international agencies operating inside Afghanistan have now left completely. Mm -hmm. And that means that in the past, when we would, um, you have a system and you, look, you, you search Afghanistan, uh, and agencies would file all those reports, whether it was earthquakes, whether it was the refugee um, returnees in Tolham and Ghulam Khan, uh, which are two border crossings. 
uh, in different parts of Afghanistan, we would have pictures or videos or voices from those people. Now we don't do that because freelancers like Ali don't, don't have enough people sponsoring him. Or permits. Or permits <laughs> to file for those agencies. And we in London or DC, which is where Voice of America, Bestest Organization, they work, or in, in Germany, uh, DW, Deutschwelle, in France and other, other countries where organizations for Afghanistan, we work. We don't get those pictures, so we don't tell those stories. Mm. And, and some people will say, well, what's the problem with that? There is a problem. The problem is that local voices beyond the corridors of power don't make it to, to platforms where they should be heard. And that plays a role in the marginalization of people, in the vacuum and the gap that exists between those who govern and those who are being governed. Mm -hmm. And also, in, in places like Herat and uh, in Paktia, mm -hmm. where the earthquakes happened, there were so many stories that could have been told, but they were, we weren't able mm -hmm. to cover them. One of the stories that comes out, and I, and I haven't been able to verify this, precisely because of the reason and access to information, was that in the earthquake in Herat, Ibrahim would know more about that, there were uh, the casualties, there were more female casualties than men. And one of the stories is that that was because of Taliban's restriction on women, so women didn't leave the house and they were at home. Mm -hmm. Now this is a story that goes around on social media and it's, it's, it's a rumor. I have not been able to speak to somebody and verify that, to say, hey, first of all, tell us what is the number. Mm -hmm. to, can our team go and assess for ourselves to see how it, like, what, it, what went there, what, you know, what happened? So we could ask those questions, we could hear from people, and then you are left with these rumors, and these rumors circulate, they are reinforced, they are quoted, they are brought on platforms like this, and it becomes, as I mentioned them, right? So there are people who just take these rumors mm. as facts. And can so you just the say dangers like then for everybody, um, and, and it, it's this, this absence of information, incredible information, and another impact of that is the, the proliferation of, or the spreading of fake, mm -hmm. fake news and fake stories. Misinformation and disinformation has been used um, in the past, and it still is an issue. So you have a lot of misinformed content mm -hmm. um, that makes around, and people make decisions on the basis of those information, and it makes it to outsiders who yeah. don't know anything about Afghanistan. We're actually going to get to that uh, in our next round. Uh, and it's going to be talking a lot more about, sure. about, about the Herat earthquake yes. thing. Go ahead. This is, again, the problem of not understanding the context and the situation. If you look at where the, I was there, if you look at where the biggest victims of the earthquake, it was not the city of Herat. It was in the villages two hours, mm -hmm. one hour along long dirt paths mm -hmm. in mud homes. Those women were not accountants. Mm -hmm. Those women were not working in offices. They could barely get to the city. So again, that's why I think it's so important to have accurate on the ground information because obviously anybody who knows anything about Afghanistan knows that the women of Zindajan were likely not going to an office during the day. They were at home because the men were in the field uh, and you know, they had to take care of the house. Great, thank you. So in my introductory jitters, I forgot to tell everyone that there's a QR code on your table uh, for questions. So if you would like to send us some questions, uh, I'll be fielding the questions uh, on my iPad here. So please go ahead and ask your questions through the QR code. Um, Ibrahim, uh, could we talk a little bit about your personal experience? You're on the ground, uh, you're uh, conducting research uh, on Afghanistan. Can we just hear a little bit about your personal experiences? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief as I'm not good at, uh, with speaking about myself, but um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that I'm not a journalist uh, per se. We, uh, Crisis Group is a registered NGO inside Afghanistan and th that means we're uh, subjected to a different legal framework and that has, uh, I suppose, it's good and bad. We don't have the magic card which opens a lot of doors that um, some journalists do, but uh, <laughs> at the same time, our perceptions, there are more positive perceptions, I'll say, uh, towards analysts in, a sen in some ways. Part of that's because we don't have to chase the story which, uh, let's face it, media, negative media, you know, uh, uh, gets attention and I suppose uh, we are naturally inclined towards chasing that and 
a government obviously um, would prefer positive media about them rather than all the things that are going wrong with the country. Uh, they also, uh, uh, I think the Taliban uh, have this idea about especially foreign journalists, and I come under the foreign analysts uh, category, so hence why I'm focusing on foreign journalists. Uh, I think they have this perception about foreign journalists that they don't take the time to come to Afghanistan, do the research. They come once a year in August every year to talk about how bad things are the next anniversary of the Taliban's takeover. And, and this August, I think, uh, again, I would invite uh, Mr. Latifi and uh, Ms. Safi to uh, speak to that. But my perception was that there were severe restrictions against foreigners coming into Afghanistan and reporting about the second anniversary of the Taliban's takeover, precisely because they saw the first anniversary, what the coverage would look like. Uh, with us, I think we, we, we are in a fortunate position where we are able to take our time and speak with different stakeholders and write long, lengthy, boring reports that nobody reads, but where we get to cover different uh, pers uh, perspectives and that, in, in some ways, shields us from accusations of misreporting and whatnot. I'll stop there. Thank you. And Ali, can we just go back to the question of <laughs> fake news, misinformation, yeah, disinformation? You must deal with that a lot. It's a massive problem, and obviously, you know, given what's going on in Gaza right now, we can see how bad misinformation can be, right? The whole beheaded baby story, whatnot. But in Afghanistan, it's also a huge issue, right? For instance, this thing about the Herat earthquake women, which I don't, I'm not trying to discredit Khanum Safai because I have immense respect for her. I'm just saying the fact that this did take off and other people told me about it. I'm like, think about it logically, you know? Um, and then you also have, CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post, foreign policy have all reported things that either had to be completely retracted, seen staged, or uh, were highly like doubtable, right? Like like just highly questionable, uh, and it just seems like this 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 notion of checking your so just basic uh, uh, again uh, as Sano said you know basic journalistic integrity even amongst these major major media outlets seems to have gone out the window uh, and then that creates a problem for us inside the country and then you have the even bigger problem of these so-called exile media you know I was in a on, a on an online conference with with people from uh, these exiled media outlets and they very clearly said oh we don't bother talking to the Taliban because they lie the US lies, the Israelis lie, a lot of places lie. You know, but at your job as a journalist, I didn't like talking to the Republic. If I could avoid it, I would. I would find like their quote on the AP or something and take that. But if I had to talk to them, I would talk to them. Mm -hmm. Or I would say they didn't talk to me. Same thing with the Emirate, because there is no choice. This is what you have to do. But it's gotten to the point where we have media outlets that have claimed that people are dead who are still alive claimed that uh, you know, they did a, a report on the Taliban leadership uh, on the second anniversary. They got people's names wrong. They got people's provinces wrong. They got people's ethnicities wrong. Like very basic mm -hmm. fact checking. Um, you, know, you have the head of one of these exile media outlets openly saying something on Twitter along the lines of, oh, you can't speak Dari in the airport in Kabul. You can only speak Pashto. Just with no, with no he hasn't been there in four or five years. If that were true, I couldn't travel through the airport because my Pashto sucks, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense. And my thing is, the situation is bad. It's, I'm not saying it's good at all. I can give you a million reasons why it's bad. So why, are we, why do we have to exaggerate and make things up that, that have no relevance, mm -hmm. that have no, no accuracy to them? And you know, you prided yourself, again, as Hano said, the biggest achievement of the occupation was the advancement of Afghan media. I am the grandson of a famous, famous writer in Afghanistan. Journalism is in my family's blood. His brother was a famous journalist. His nephew was, 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 was a filmmaker, a director. So this is very important to me. And I do not understand why these outlets now run by some of the most well-known young Afghan journalists in the country have decided to put out that Look, I'm not happy with the Islamic Emirate. I'm not happy with the Taliban. But I don't want to, you know, sort of um, sacrifice my journalistic integrity. Because the only thing I have for the end of time is my name. 
And I may not like them, I may be upset at them, believe me, I argue with them all the time. I was wrongfully arrested by them, you know? But still, to me, it's more important to get accurate information out of my country than to get back at them. And I understand, it's very painful. In, in September 2021, I had to come to Doha and then Istanbul for a while, and I was out of the country for like six, seven months, and it was like the worst experience of my life. And I didn't know if I could go back. I took the risk, I went back, and Alhamdulillah, so far I'm alive. But, uh, you know, to me, what is important is having the privilege that I have with, with two passports is doing my job, putting the information out there, and more than anything, uh, telling the people's story. I really don't care about, look, the Republic, we didn't, you know, there's all kinds of questions about their elections, right? They didn't necessarily, they definitely didn't represent the Afghan people. These guys don't represent the Afghan people. In, you know, in one day, the entire country changed, right? In my parents' lifetime, I was in Turkey during the coup attempt, and they're like, oh, don't worry about it tomorrow on the radio, you know, because they were used to all of this. Mm -hmm. In my parents' lifetime, there's probably been like five or six regime changes in Afghanistan. So what should be important is obviously your reputation, but also the people and telling their stories. You can hate whatever government. I certainly do not like the Republic, and I certainly don't like these guys. But to can me, I, what's important is telling the story mm, of the people. Can I just jump in here? Um, I don't want us this. I don't want this session to become an Afghan on Afghan yeah. um, session. I think there are valid points on all fronts. You know, the diaspora media they cover it, but they truly feel that if they had access to information, if they, their requests were met by the authorities, if they could be given the same opportunities, not just the same opportunities that they had in the, the Republic, even a 1% of it, then they would spend their time, because resources are, there is a shortage of resources as well, mm -hmm. then they would spend their time and, and tell those stories accurately. So I don't believe that, or I try not to believe that everything is done deliberately. I don't think that's the case. I think mistakes happen, and it happens because they don't have access to those very vital information. The, very, the, new, the, the new outlets that have sprung up after the Taliban takeover, they had to come about because there was a complete absence of the Afghan narrative, the Afghan story. Mm -hmm. The stories were not coming out. And if I show you my phone, I was, after the, the, the collapse, Women and young women and men who worked with the security forces, they would send me voice notes and I can play you one for their safety, I'm not gonna do that. The stories that were so horrific that I, I had to then pitch that and then explain to my editors to say why we need to pursue the story and it would take a long time. There were stories that were really important and people needed to tell this and the authorities are not gonna, of course, just give you a license to say yes, you can come and and investigate what happened with security forces. They're not going to agree to that. The Taliban are not going to. So the, the journalists are, are forced to find ways to tell those stories mm -hmm. because there is a demand from the people who suffer on a daily basis. And another issue that is very important is that Afghanistan's population is estimated to be nearly 40 million. It's possible that all stories are true at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, there are 40 million stories and things happen. Things have had to happen to people. It's not a one mm -hmm. template, it's not a blanket all is rosy, or it's not a blanket all is doom and gloom. There are nuances, and I think sometimes it gets lost, and precisely the reason we don't hear from those different perspectives is because there, is a res there, there are restrictions, and those restrictions are making it harder for people to operate. Mm -hmm. The example of women, for example, right? They have been forced to now wear, like, the, it's full hijab, they have always had hijab. It was never like, no. they couldn't um, not have their scarves, they did. Now they, had to oper they have to operate with a mask on. Mm -hmm. Imagine how hard it is for a normal, you know, in a normal society to have your, in a normal setting, but to then have the pressure of working under time pressure to a deadline, pursuing some very serious subjects, you know, people's lives and very sensitive issues. And then also on top of that, deal with the sort of requirements the Taliban now demand. It is, it is difficult, but as I said, there are 40 million stories mm. and we, are, we don't have enough manpower, we don't have enough resources to tell those stories. 
And what could happen, what should happen, is that that space be slightly more expanded so those new voices can come through and it will work for both sides. It will work for the current authorities as well. But again, I'm talking about basic fact, people's names, where they're from, their ethnicity. Like These are things you can check, right? right. Or claiming that uh, Mullah Baradar, who's what, like deputy, what is he? He has, he has a big role, right? Uh, claiming that he's dying in a hospital in Dubai when he's sitting in a meeting, I can't remember, it was in Herat or Qandar, like, or I'll give you an example, and this affects people's real lives. Saying that the Turkish embassy shut down. I was sitting in a restaurant waiting, waiting to, to, to meet a source for a story. My cousin calls me frantic, frantic. Ali, 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 is it true? I'm like, what? He's like, that the, that the Turkish embassy shut down. I messaged the foreign uh, ministry. They sent me a tweet showing the guy sitting with, I don't know, someone, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of Interior, in a meeting that very day. You know, these things are extremely dangerous. If you don't know for sure, I was in the Al Jazeera newsroom when we first got the footage that Qazafi was killed, right? We argued for four hours whether to say dead in quotes or to say dead mm. until we finally verified and verified and verified and verified. Because the argument was like, we're not going to kill the guy in quotes. Mm -hmm. You know, these are very important basic practices of journalism, and you have even more responsibility now because there are people inside the country who are per affected by this, who will face depression because of this, who will change the way they operate their lives because of this. Mm -hmm. So it's very important that you get your facts straight. You are being funded by foreign governments. They're giving you money to do your job as a journalist. You damn well better do it as well as you can. So absolutely. And uh, the talk of getting your facts straight is uh, your research as well. So the International Crisis Group uh, has, is publishing or will publish soon a full report on uh, the Taliban's regional engagement. Can you tell us a little bit about how you did the research and uh, some of the content? Uh, sure. Uh, uh, the project uh, was envisaged uh, in about mid-2022 and the reason for uh, after the Taliban announced the reversal on the reopening of girls' secondary schools in March 2022, it became increasingly clear we were beginning to see a chasm in the international approach to the country. Uh, I think part of this was, and to link it back to our discussion, part of it, it was because of the media reporting. Uh, the media not only gets sometimes, uh, some of the medias are not, uh, it's a general statement, but I don't uh, hope it's not taken as such. Don't uh, all, uh, sometimes get the facts wrong. Sometimes they can manipulate or even right. launch campaigns against people who are taking a political stance. And we saw a very prominent example against an Afghan woman who came from Kabul to uh, advocate for a position who was subjected to such a smear campaign. Uh, but what's happening, especially with the uh, English language uh, media reporting, uh, it seems to be limiting space for diplomacy, at least uh, uh, contributing to this chasm where we are seeing regional countries who are in fits and starts but committed to the idea of continuing to try uh, to engage with the t authorities to see how things, uh, things go. And then we have many uh, the, uh, Western countries who are increasingly finding it difficult to uh, practically engage uh, partly because of the, uh, the Taliban's behavior, uh, understandably, but also partly because the whole, uh, the entire domestic constituency is beginning to form uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, perception about Afghanistan comparable to North Korea and uh, other uh, uh, regimes around the world that makes it difficult for diplomatic uh, maneuver space. Uh, so we wanted to speak with regional countries to under get a better understanding why they were uh, uh, going about it. And just a couple of quick anecdotes. Uh, uh, when I was researching the, the uh, report, I came across a report from Crisis Group in 20, uh, 2002, so about 21 years ago. The Taliban had collapsed and Crisis Group, uh, not me by the way, I, I haven't been with Crisis Group for that long, but someone had written re a report about Central Asian countries that uh, uh, and their issues with Afghanistan. And there was a quote there saying that Central Asian countries now believe that the approach of the 1990s of ignoring Afghanistan was not successful and they will never repeat that mistake. They will continue to engage with the country regardless. 
and that quote kind of stuck with me. And the other um, uh, anecdote is I was speaking with a re uh, regional diplomat who told us, look, uh, we can't wait for Western sentiments to shift in favor of the Taliban. We are here in the front lines. We have basic issues we need to deal with, you know, whether it's water, whether it's security, whether it's economy. So we need to continue to engage with the Taliban regardless. Uh, so I think that, that's the spirit in which we started the report. I'm very glad to hear uh, atypical of crisis group. Perhaps I'm to blame. The report still hasn't been published uh, to us, uh, uh, and most of it's my fault. I keep getting overtaken by events, uh, and a crisis group has a very tedious editing process uh, um, that can contribute to it as well. But uh, it was very. Uh, uh, encouraging to see that the UN taking a very similar, there was a realization I think internationally that uh, the consensus we had around Afghanistan was beginning to fray and that we needed to do something to try to get all the different parties on board. And uh, the, the decision by the UN Security Council to appoint us a coordinator uh, that has very recently and in the last panel we heard that the panel has already begun to make uh, uh, recommendations and the report, I'm not sure if it's publicly available, but it seems to have been uh, submitted. Uh, it, it's very encouraging to see that there, are, there is this collective endeavor going on and trying to find common ground on how do we take this issue forward despite the challenges and despite the uh, you know, calamities that we continue to face. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, I'm going to start taking some questions from the audience. Uh, we have a few questions here uh, and a couple on the diaspora media. <laughs> um, <laughs> I see you laughing. So everyone has something to say uh, positively or negatively and how is it help or helping or hindering uh, news from, from or on Afghanistan? Well, first of all, there are different diaspora media and their funding models are different and their operational mandates are different. So you have the, the likes of the BBC, which is a public uh, funded organization. It's funded by the public. There is a license fee and that goes to the BBC mm -hmm. and that's how they're funded. So it's a publicly funded organization and, and that's how they work. The Voice of America, I'm not sure what their model is, but I, for as far as I know, the, the funding is Congress, um, mm -hmm. really, uh, Congress approves their funding. Then you have the new diaspora media. They Those are, are the ones I'm talking about. Sorry? Those are the ones I've been talking exactly. about. The new diaspora media that came, um, that they were established after the takeover, from what I hear, some of them are funded by regional countries, mm -hmm. including Afghanistan's uh, long-term uh, supporters in the past, but now uh, they're changing or they're shifting their, their policies. I'm not going to name them. Um, I've also heard rumors that um, uh, there is a partnership between uh, different um, foes and, and, and friends. They, they fund others, but they're also organizations that are funded by private uh, donations uh, and that uh, if you go to their websites and their, the, their information, their about page, you should be able to see who funds these organizations and then that tells you a lot about what they, they, they do. So those are different and all of those organizations will have their, you know, their own, um, I guess their own agenda. reasons and agendas and um, line of work and um, what we have in the, in the BBC, we also have the media guidelines. Mm -hmm. Their media guidelines will be different. So not, and I think there is a, um, on the part of the current authorities in Afghanistan, uh, there is a lack of information about who these media organizations are. And just the same way as others make the mistake of treating the Afghan diaspora as a monolithic group, or the Afghans as a monolithic group, or the Pashtuns as a monolithic group, the Taliban seem to be doing the same thing with the media organization. Mm -hmm. They seem to think that it's a one group with, you know, completely regarding everything that I just mm -hmm. said. So I think there is room for both sides. Um, and, I, and maybe, I guess, people in this room could even take that further. There's a lot of need for training, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the current authorities to be able to differentiate between what these medias are and what they stand for. I mean, our motto in the BBC is inform, educate, and entertain. Mm -hmm. And so far, uh, we have been doing the informing and we've been doing the educating because of the funding reasons we can't do the entertainment because um, times are tough for everybody and our money comes from the public and it's public. Mm -hmm. that we are accountable to them at the end of the day. And everyone's being entertained on social exactly. media anyway. And, so. and, and yeah, and our habits of consumption mm -hmm. have changed as well. Mm -hmm. 
the audience behavior has changed. And <coughs> these are the things that I think there's a lot to be done about. Um, and, and I don't think there's enough dialogue, mm -hmm. enough information sharing Thank you. Uh, for people to, to have that perspective. Thank you. Ali, you uh, laughed when I asked uh, the no, question. No, no, because I wanted to make it clear. When I said, like, because they use the term diaspora media, I would call them, like, well, they call themselves media and exile. That's specifically what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. I'm not saying the BBC or VOA or whatever. That's a completely different model. They have standards, you know. Um, well, yeah. Uh, but, uh, um, right. So, so, so this is the thing, is that, Unfortunately, even with all of the advances the media really has made uh, in the last 20 years, whoever has been in charge, they do see the media as a monolith. The Republic definitely saw the media, media as a monolith. You know, if the New York Times wrote something that they didn't like, they would take it out on everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many times they said, we need to shut down Tolo? Mm -hmm. They hated Tolo. You know, there were people who came from Norway and the US and Canada and whatnot who would tell me there's too much freedom of speech in Afghanistan. You know, they would literally tell me that. One of them, who, he worked for the national broadcaster, he came from Norway. He's like, oh, well, you know, in the United States, you, you can't make fun of the president. I'm like, wait, wait, what? I grew up there, I, through, I don't know how many administrations. Oh, believe me, you, they definitely make fun of them, right? So that is an issue always, that the government in Afghanistan, so whether it was the Republic and now the Emirate, they do not understand the role of the media properly, and they do conflate you with the others. They will say, oh, well, Amu said this, and International said this, and you're not them, are you? It has an impact on how we do our jobs, uh, and it creates more suspicion for us. So that's, again, why I'm saying the accuracy is very, very important. You know, like I said, we, we literally said we don't want to kill Qazafi in quotes, you know? That's the level you need to be at, because that is the impact of what you do. Uh, and we have a question here about uh, how is social media transforming everything? How is YouTube, all the YouTubers that you mentioned earlier, how, how are these new forms of media changing things? Would you like to go? No. I'll prefer one of you guys take it. It's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one. Social media in the past, and particularly under the Republic uh, regime in the Republic, it was flourishing, it was, uh, people had access to it, and there was a sense of people can say anything on social media, the politicians would take their frustrations out. And I, to be absolutely fair, I liked it, because it allowed people to express whatever it was that they could express. There was no sense of, Let's hold in you know, and let's mm -hmm. uh, battle them for, for saying something. And it was important because, as we talked about in the previous um, session, there's so much trauma in Afghanistan. And part of it is because people have not been able to listen to each other. And another reason that people have not been able to talk about some of the sufferings that they, they endured. So social media was a way for them to just take that out. And it took the pressure away from, from the media in some sense. And it was, to be fair, it allowed there was a two-way interaction. So they consumed the content, they commented, they critiqued, and they wrote us back. They even said, you know, this is rubbish, change it. But there, were, there was a good interaction. What happened after the takeover, because of the loss of purchasing power, people became poorer, and that meant that they don't have uh, enough money to spend on internet that then allows them not to have the, the internet, the connectivity that is required. And the only voices you see on social media so, so far or to this day are people who are either outside the country, one, two, or people who have the means mm -hmm. to, to be, they are the privileged few, I call them the privileged few. Not every Afghan, I mean, particularly if you're a woman, if you don't have the right education, if, you, if, you have, if your priorities are different, you know, you're struggling to put food on the table, that is your priority. You can't make, you can't buy an internet package to get on social media. Some people do, but that, so, so that has changed. And lately what I've seen, this toxicity that on social media that you described, Ellie described, uh, it is true. And it's on both sides. So 
I used to have groups on my Twitter um, account and I would rank all Afghans. So it was the Republic, I've had them in the Republic group and if they were young you know, intellectuals and people um, who were engaged in spaces like this, I would have different groups. And it, that gave me an indication how much those people were, they were so apart, they couldn't, even back then like there were disagreements, but now it has become a complete, I, I don't want to say war because it's just too much, but it's just so toxic that they, you can be labeled easily, you can be, um, so labels are problematic mm -hmm. because just because I speak Pashto, I could be lab labeled as pro-Talib, mm -hmm. Pashtunist, Pashtun supremacist, or you know, this, that. And the same way if, for example, a minority person is talking about pan share, then they would say, you know, yeah, he or she comes from that community. Mm -hmm. Just because he or she comes from that community doesn't really mean that, that they support what was going on, but they could be talking about what is happening, the realities mm -hmm. of pan share or the Hazara community when they talk about their marginalization. So people have really lost that ability to, to listen to each other and it has become toxic. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quite toxic because of the trauma that they have suffered. Mm -hmm. You know, their families are in Afghanistan or others have lost the livelihoods and the means, others were killed. Mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the individuals who were in, in the security forces, they suffered torture, uh, imprisonment, some, some were killed in the most mm -hmm. horrific manner. And those are, and it's, I think it's understandable to, for people to react in ways that you don't expect. So currently, social media is very toxic. And another thing that doesn't help, I think, is the algorithm change on Twitter. Now, I barely go to Twitter when I do, because it's, ever since Elon Musk has taken over, he has completely changed it. Um, on Instagram, Instagram is slightly safer than it used to be. But the majority of Afghans, I would say, they're on, on Facebook because it's the most accessible medium for them. Mm -hmm. And a smaller community is now on YouTube as well. They produce mm -hmm. with long form. Um, the YouTubing community in, in the country mm -hmm. was, yes. uh, th that is still there. So yeah, there. Yeah. The so the YouTube community in Afghanistan is strong? I think the social media community in mm -hmm. Afghanistan is still strong, mm -hmm. actually. Um, I don't, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, it has become toxic in that way, but like, Twitter has been toxic since mm -hmm. basically it's existed since you know probably the last ten years and again during the former government it was highly toxic they they love to weaponize uh, social media um, I don't know because like I said like when we were in Herat I saw for instance like those girls who said we're with social media I don't know what that really meant but you know them and then a friend of mine Imran Wadan you should all follow him on Instagram on YouTube. He goes across the country, he shows different provinces, he takes drone shots, he went, him and his friends spent a week, they drove all the way to Herat, helped, did everything. TikTok is massive, even though it's technically banned, everybody in Afghanistan knows what a VPN is now. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, everybody knows what a VPN is now because they are all constantly on TikTok. And on TikTok, you have everything from like young boys and girls who, so strange, despite the ban, they still get endorsement deals from the major telecom providers and banks and cell phone companies and such, right? Uh, to someone like General Mubin, who is, I guess, a Talib or a Talib supporter, who makes like these funny videos that everybody still follows no matter what, so you get the spectrum. Um, and there are these weird sort of like social media TikTok stars out of Af within Afghanistan uh, and also abroad. So I do think, again, it's good that it hasn't gone away, it hasn't collapsed. You see young girls going into like, obviously they're the ones with money, going into restaurants and stores and such and like uh, taking pictures and having like these little photo shoots and such. Um, and that, that's actually what makes me happy because I feel like there is this sort of, TikTok has, uh, you know, it, it's bridged all ages in Afghanistan now, but something like Instagram, like it really, is very youth focused and it shows um, you know, the fact that they still use it, the fact that they're still into it, the fact that they still make some kind of an effort to put content mm -hmm. out there. Um, so no, I, I don't think it's gone away at all. I think, you know, and, and the thing is we, we know that for, for, for most people, I mean now for most people in Afghanistan, it used to be the internet was Facebook, now it's TikTok. 
And people will, you know, they'll, they'll spend 50 Avranis and only activate a couple hundred megabytes just so that they can keep that going. Mm -hmm. um, because it's one of the few pleasures, right? Like families are not legally allowed to go together to a park anymore, right? Um, the, you can go out to eat, but how much money does the average person family have? They go, but you know you can only go so much. There's, there really isn't much social activity in Afghanistan, unfortunately, that was never developed over the last 20 years. So the one thing that people can do is basically sit on their phones mm -hmm. uh, and create content for their phones. Mm -hmm. so, so luckily, I feel like that's still alive. As it is everywhere in the world, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question here about ethnically biased media. Uh, is there anything that you can say about how it's, uh, what kind of reporting is happening and what are the consequences? I think it's important to understand that we all have biases. All of us, regardless of which ethnicity we come from, we have biases. And it comes out in different ways uh, if you don't keep keep check, if you don't check yourself and, and double check yourself and triple check yourself, it can come out. Mm -hmm. It requires understanding and, and a lot of work on your part as, as an individual. So that is there. Ethnically biased media comes back to the media ownership. There are, in the previous regime as well, um, there were allegations that some media were heavy from what one ethnicity or that ethnicity and the storytelling then came from that prism, the prism of that, that media outlet, uh, that, that ethnic group. Um, in the past, what happened in the Republic particularly, people, strong men, mostly invested in channels of their own mm -hmm. and they had their own outlets. And that became a culture uh, for some reason, which was weird and <laughs> I never understood it. What, what meant was they would have their own TV channel and then they would, they would put their own view, view across. And they would also have a few other individuals, mostly young people. And then the, those who were watching or consuming the content, they automatically assumed that, oh, so-and-so in the north of the country, that strong person in the north of the country has his own channel, so this must be the views of that ethnic, mm -hmm. ethnic group. And I think it may be just because people didn't have enough understanding that there was a difference between the individual and his wider ethnic group. Because again, as we talked about this, even in the same ethnicity, as I, I speak Pashto and, I, and, I, and I'm Pashto, and so I would, I would say Ibrahim is, Ibrahim and I don't agree on many things, I'm sure. We come from the same group, but we do not agree on, on a lot of things. And, and it's the same with other ethnic groups. You know, there's so much diversity. Mm -hmm. If you are, no two Afghans agree on, on major mm -hmm. themes. So it, it's, it's difficult to answer the question. Yes, there are biases, I wouldn't deny that. Do I say that it's systematically ethnic funded by one ethnicity to bash the other mm -hmm. ethnicity? I think it's a little sophisticated, so just that that's, that's mm -hmm. happening, it's a little sophisticated for Afghanistan. Um, I think things happen. Um, again, I don't believe that intentionally people are, are doing harm, but there will be individuals who do that. But then it's like any society. There is an opportunity and people will, will exploit it. You know, they will exploit it because they think that is in their advantage. So I don't know if that answers the questions or not, but mm -hmm. that would Thank that you. Would Stop that. Does anyone want to take up the question? Uh, sure. Um, it's related to the question, but um, let me add my own clarification when we were talking about diaspora media. <clears throat> In a sense, all three of us uh, represent uh, di diaspora media institutions. So uh, I think the, uh, the point, the clarification was much welcome that we are talking about uh, uh, media that propped up after the Taliban's collapse and that were. <clears throat> Uh, partly driven by uh, the trauma, that, the, the deep trauma that uh, Ms. Safi mentioned uh, for many of these individuals who were in Afghanistan for 20 years and suddenly overnight their world was turned upside down and they had to go overseas and uh, some of them have been uh, part of this uh, new uh, industry. Uh, which comes back to uh, the, the question that was raised in terms of ethnically biased media. Uh, Afghanistan has gone through nearly five decades of uh, trauma. And there is a lot of political differences. Afghanistan has seen almost six 
regime changes uh, or, or perhaps more in the span of uh, these decades. And I think it has left a collective uh, mark in terms of how do we negotiate our political differences with each other. Uh, I, I think the concept that we see in some countries, for example, where uh, public servants are able to continue to do their duty and keep their pub uh, personal political opinions aside as uh, performing their official duties, that's something that we need to instill uh, in, in all the media, but uh, also uh, particularly in the diaspora media, where you can have political differences, as Mr. Latifi pointed out, with the regime, uh, you know, and you, uh, f whether you want to overthrow it or you want to change in its policies or what, whatever, but when you're reporting as a journalist, you need to have those ethical standards and journalistic methodologies at, at the forefront of your mind. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have nothing to add to that, then uh, I'll ask a question now about, so someone asked, for people outside of Afghanistan who want to know what's going on inside Afghanistan, what do you suggest to those people to get accurate information? What, what is the most accurate sources that they can look at? Me? Yes. <laughs> no, that was my answer. <laughs> oh, you. Oh. It's me, me, freelance. Ali Latifi, everyone. You know, I, I think with, with any media, obviously not just, I'm kidding, not, not just a single source, right? As many sources, and look at the biases within them. Look at what adds up and what doesn't, you know? Again, with the, the Herat story is a great example. To all of us here who are from Afghanistan, who know Afghanistan, that story doesn't make any sense, right? Because if you just understand the geography of the situation, you're like, it doesn't make sense, you know? Or like, uh, so I think that that's the most important thing. One, making yourself media literate and understanding that just like there is bias in reporting on Gaza and Israel or the United States or whatever, there's bias in reporting in Afghanistan. And that's not just on the Afghan side, on the, on the, on the Western side too. You know, So long we, we, we hear terms like hardline extremist or male dominated society, as if the United States is not a male dominated society, you know, or um, ultra conservative or Islamist, which people don't even know what that means, so on and so forth, right? So I think if you can educate yourself and look for sort of these implicit or, or explicit, in some cases, biases within it, and try and like differentiate between that. There is no one source, but I just think in general as a consumer of media, especially in the age of social media, uh, the more you can make yourself discerning and look at different sources of information and question the things that they say. Again, like, you know, this idea of like, because uh, it's in the news right now, when, when people come and talk about Palestine, they're like, you condemn Hamas, you know? Like, why do you automatically need to say that? You know, and it's the same thing with Afghanistan. Do, do you condemn the Taliban? Like, that has nothing to do with me. You know, I'm here to talk about something else. Uh, so I think that that's the first step. Is, and if, if someone is asking that question, I think that that shows that they understand that there, there can be really problematic reporting. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the initial step. Uh, I know, Ali, you spoke a little bit earlier about being detained at some point. <laughs> Has anyone else experienced, uh, we have a question, any of the panel members feared for their life or been in imminent danger while reporting? Just you, Ali. Uh, I mean, look, like, the truth is, first of all, reporting in Afghanistan, I'm sure even in the past, I all felt this way. You never knew when a bomb would go off. You never knew when you would drive over a landmine. You never knew when you would cross a checkpoint back when the Taliban were in armed opposition and were the main issue for insecurity on the roads. You know, now that they love to claim, like, oh, the roads are secure. I wonder why. <laughs> um, that, that was an issue. And absolutely, like I said, like last year, I was operating without a permit. I only dared to go to the two provinces closest to Kabul, Logad and Padwan, and even then, I went very quickly and came back, went with friends, you know, tried to be as low-key as possible and just hoped. And even to this day, just because I have a piece of paper doesn't mean that they couldn't have an issue with something that I say one day and make up. Again, I still to this day do not know why Murtaza Behboudi was arrested. He was arrested for something like 285 days. Nobody in this country knows why he was arrested. So that fear is always there, and that fear doesn't go away. And as much as I say, like, things are operating, 
that's not to discount that that fear mm -hmm. absolutely 100% exists and is possible. Yeah. And Ibrahim, do you get these uh, clear red lines about what you can and cannot research? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, um, at what I've seen uh, in the reporting space is when you make a claim that is controversial or disagreeable to the Taliban, they want you to prove it mm. in, in one sense or another. I mean, I don't know what this standard or threshold for <laughs> proof mm. exactly is, but uh, in our space, as I said, we try to uh, portray diverse, differing, disagreeing perspectives. And I, we haven't had any issues uh, from the Taliban. Or uh, often, it's an uncontroversial position when you're able to portray different. It's when you take a political stance on an issue which is disagreeable to the people mm -hmm. who have authority over you uh, that usually you run into trouble. So we haven't really had mm -hmm. uh, those kind of issues. Uh, we have a, here a question for Sana. Um, you, when was the last time you were in Afghanistan, and how has that either changed, uh, challenged, or helped uh, your coverage? I left Afghanistan in 2007. Uh, I was working with a local media radio TV station in Jalalabad, and that's how I went to the UK as part of my work, and then I got a job with the BBC, so I went to the UK. And then the first time I went back to Afghanistan was in 2014. It was for a reporting, um, a report about corruption. It's still available. Corruption. Uh, the, we had a series in, in uh, wide, BBC, BBC wide series about, it was called Richer World, how the world was getting richer but also poorer. Some parts of the world was getting richer, other parts was getting poorer. And I did a story about Afghanistan's 9-11 millionaires, and, and we don't have a billionaire, millionaires, how individuals who, who made money after the war. And, and the war created an economy, and there were some people who did really well. And I went to Dubai, um, and I went to Afghanistan. And the story I did was um, we looked at the different communities, how Afghans were getting poorer by the day, and yet there were villas being bought right, left, and center by the Afghan warlords. I was told in Dubai that 25% of the Palm Jumeirah properties there were owned by Afghan warlords. And it was shocking at a time that Afghans were, were they had barely anything to eat. And, when you, and I went and spoke to these individuals. And the, the questions, I said, do you even have a connection with, like, do you even realize and, and I know who those were because the way that they made their money, and that's when I felt a threat. Um, I had to leave Afghanistan soon after that because individuals, I was told by one of the colleagues I was working in with, he said, you know, this is a mafia, it's a syndicate, leave as soon as you can. There's people, as soon as they realize that there is, a, hmm. there is anybody asking questions about somebody's wealth, um, it can be problematic, mm -hmm. so leave. And that was, it was a very, um, actually that was the second, the second trip that I did, that was in 2015. The first one was in 2014. Um, I, went, I interviewed the wife of uh, President Ashraf Ghani, Rola uh, Ghani. At that time there was so much hope and so much aspiration that there was a new woman, she was half, um, she was not half, she was fully foreign and foreign blood and she would come in and help. Um, so there was a lot of positive hope, and we did a story about that. And also, it was an incredibly um, new story because there was an Afghan man, a Muslim man, in, in the presidential palace for the first time um, in decades. He thanked his wife in his inaugura inauguration speech. It was a lot, there was a lot of tolerance and respect and, and all that. So I thought that was a really good story. So we, I spoke to Rola and I spoke to um, her brothers in Lebanon and her family. We did a profile piece about her that was well received. So the second trip was in 2015, which was about a corruption. The third one was in 2016. And I uh, reported about women in security, in the security force. Um, the National Intelligence uh, Agency as well as um, on the front line. Um, and the story was how there was a drive to recruit more female officers uh, that would help you know, with, uh, with other issues that they had at that time. But also about mid midwives. At that time, uh, the figure that I found, there were only 3,000 midwives for the entire Afghanistan. And that figure shocked me, and that still stays with me. I went to the Malalai um, 
a hospital. Uh, and I saw how things were. It, it, was, it was a very sad time, but also there was a lot of progress mm -hmm. that was being made in regards to reducing mental, um, maternal mortality. So that was the story. How has my reporting helped or hindered? I would say um, what helped me the most was when I went to the UK. Um, I was on my own, but also I was um, the decision I made at that time. My mother, in fact, when I went to the UK, I felt the community there was slightly more conservative than I was. And I called my mother and I said, you know, I was living under the Taliban. I, you know, I went to under the Taliban um, in the 90s. Yet people here are slightly <laughs> different. And my mother gave me the number one advice that I will never forget and I will always be grateful. She said, try and keep a healthy distant, distance with your community. Don't go too far that you're completely out of what is happening, that you completely lose you know, what, who you are and your values and everything, but don't go too close that you become lost in the fog. And I thought that was because she realized that we were all traumatized by the war. And she said that was the best place for you. And that's how I decided that I would stay and work in the, in the Afghanistan department. But in terms of my own, um, that, that healthy distance would always be there. And that really helped. In terms of going back to Afghanistan, it does help to see things from your own perspective. Like the three trips I did was where there was corruption or maternal health or uh, women in the police force. That really helped me to see that there was a gradual and healthy um, and also problematic progress. The progress was uneven because the people I was speaking to or the Afghans who would come to the UK and I would speak to them, they would say, you know, everything is fine. You come to Kabul, Kabul is like Europe. And then I would tell the same guys and I would say, I know, I'm aware of the parties, I'm aware of the best times you guys are having, I'm aware of you know, but I'm also aware of what is happening in Helmand. Mm. I'm also aware of what's happening in Ghazni or in Tahar or in the war where women were flogged during the, the Republic. Mm. Women were stoned to death under the, in the, not in the Taliban regime, but in the um, uh, government. And, I, and they would say, yes, but we can't get to war. You know, it's such a lawless place. And then I would say, so why is that lawlessness? You know, so it, I think it, and also the, another thing that happened with that um, really healthy distance was the Afghans were trusting me. To this day, I can go and I can confidently say this, I can speak to anybody. They would trust me because they know that somebody comes from a background who, is, who was not part of the whole bubble. She understands. She understands enough that I don't sound silly when I talk to her about these issues because she's one of us. But she's not too involved to be able to judge, to judge me in a and sense. And to see it with a new perspective as well. I really don't want to cut you off, Sana, because I could listen to you all day, but we are out of time. Uh, thank you all, audience members, for your really excellent questions. And if I could take one quote out of today, uh, and that came from you, Sana, which is, there are 40 million stories out of Afghanistan, and today you've listened to three. So thank you very much.